Well, all right, you guys. I hope uh, you're ready to um, keep up with me this morning. Um, on such a, a joyous occasion, I'm going to hate to have to get so heavy, but I think there's a reason for this. I think, I think that God has shown me some things in the, my research and the study in the past uh, in the past couple of weeks that I think uh, everyone here needs to hear. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and say that this is probably one of the most important messages that I will ever preach in my life. And I hope that you guys can stay with me because um, um, I, I hope you don't, um, I just hope you don't let your mind drift, okay? I want you to take your Bibles this morning and I want you to turn uh, first to Revelation chapter 13. Um, I've got a pretty long, I've got a PowerPoint this morning that I think is important for us to do and what I'm calling this uh this message this morning is in game, and you're going to see in a few minutes why. But I'm I'm calling it in game, and I'm calling it the final days of America. And I just want to tell you that I am uh, I'm disturbed, but I'm also encouraged because I know this is going to be heavy in some points. But I want you to know that I believe no matter what is coming, and no matter what we'll have to go through, I believe there God's power is stronger than the power of the devil that God can protect and deliver his people, and that even if some of us have to go through some persecution and even some very tough things, that God is still able to give us strength through it all. Amen? Revelation chapter 13, are you there yet? All right, we're going we're gonna to go through quite a few scriptures. Many of you have been studying or reading or at least heard some messages about some things in the end time. I'm just going to hit, go ahead and say just at the outset that, you know, uh, this, this is not so much about trying to figure out the timing of things as it is going to be about kind of where we are as a country. Uh, I do want to say that, that I believe in the traditional, I believe in this, that there is going to be a tribulation period of seven years. I believe that there's going to be a rapture at some point within that seven years. I'm going to go ahead and tell you that I do not believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, and I believe I can prove that scripturally, but whether you believe that or you don't believe that, that's really not the issue this morning, because whether that's one thing I hope I'm wrong about, <laughs> okay? But I can say this, better to know what's coming and be prepared in case you face some of these things. Better to be prepared and to know what's going to happen, and I'm going I'm to share with you this too. Some of the things that I'm about to show you about all of this is quite disturbing and quite frightening, okay? But I want you to see it, and I want you to know it, and I want you to be warned, but I want to say this. This purpose this morning is not just for Christians to be prepared. You can say, well, this, this really, you know, we can talk about the end times. It really doesn't apply to me that much because either, you know, people take the pre-tribulation rapture view, I'm not going to be here, but let me say this. No matter what you believe, there are a lot of people are going to be here. A lot of people that think they're Christians and they're not born again and they're not obeying God and they're not walking in holiness and purity, they are not going to go. And we are going, we are going to have to take some of these things. And I want to tell you that, that God, after, after getting this down in me over the last few weeks, I know now that the main reason God wants me to know these things and wants you to know these things is so that we can tell people, here is what is going to happen. This is going to happen, and when this happens, you better understand, you better know that the days are short, and you're going to have some decisions to make. So this is about witnessing as well as it is about your, your own heart and your own self being prepared, okay? Calling this end game because you're going to see that our government has, has a, a thing called end game. They have a thing called Operation End Game. But I want to read the book of Revelation. Let's go to read chapter 13 real quick. Chapter 13 is about the rise of the Antichrist, and really chapter 13 lets us know that we are three and a half years into it. This lets us know the Antichrist has three and a half years, but I want to read this starting at verse 1. And he says, I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. 
And the dragon, or Satan, gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, or that is Satan. They worshipped Satan, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast, and who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty-two months, or three and a half years. So we know that this is, as the, we'd say, the midpoint of tribulation. And it says, At this point it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given unto him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have ear to hear, let him hear. Now this, this next verse always caused me a little bit of trouble until now I understand it great in a greater measure. But he says, he that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. Now he that leadeth into captivity, just remember that, leading people into captivity. He that leads people into captivity will himself be led into captivity. Just remember that. And then he goes on to say, he that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and faith of the saints. And I beheld another beast come up out of the earth that had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. Now, this would be the false prophet. Okay, There's going to be two figures, two main figures that rise up in the end, the Antichrist, the false prophet. There'll be kings, to, there'll be the ten kings, there'll be nations that are united under these, these leaders, but we're, we're headed toward a one man ruling the world again. Okay, And it says here, that this second beast had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon, and he exercises all the power of the first beast before him, and he causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he, do, he will do great wonders, and so that he makes fire to come down from heaven and the earth in the sight of men, and deceives them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying unto them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast that had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak, and he calls as many as that would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Are you hearing this? We read over stuff, don't we? He says, anyone who will not worship that beast will be killed, and he will cause all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark, in their right hand or in their foreheads, and no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the number of the or the name of the beast or the number of his name, and here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, three score and six, or six hundred and sixty six. Now I just wanted to read this because there's some things that I want you to see that, that the Bible told us a long time ago would be happening, and that's happening before us. Now, one of the things that, that this tells us is that for there to be a, for, for us to get to the place to have a world government and have one man in control of a world government, that, that this had to be happening or these changes had to be going on for years, okay, for it to get to that place. And this chapter reveals that, of course, the book of Daniel reveals that. And, and so, as you'll see, we have been working, and you're going to see this, we have been working toward a world government for a long time. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on all these because most of you already know some of this stuff, but I just wanted you to see that these things are happening and, and we're headed toward this. We're also headed toward world economic control. This is what you see from the book of Revelation chapter 13, that this man and this, this false prophet, these two leaders, are going to have total economic control over the earth at the mid, by the midpoint of the tribulation, the midpoint of the seven years. They will have world control of the, the world markets, and they will cause everyone, rich or poor, it doesn't matter who you are, you're going to have to take a mark in your right hand or in your forehead to be able to buy or sell. Now, let me just say this. You're going to ha you would have to have consolidated over some years some power to be able to do that. Now, what I'm going to show you in a few minutes is that our leaders, both Republicans and Democrats and, and European leaders and leaders across the world have been working on this for, for longer, really, than 50 years. 
okay? And especially, and I'm just going to blow your mind here, and, I, and I've been a Republican uh, as long as I can remember, and I have voted Republican and conservative and pro-life, but I just want to say this to you right now. All of our leaders, all of our leaders have known this was coming, and all of them have participated. Bush, Reagan, Bush 41, all of them. And you're going to find out something else about them this morning. All of them know the power behind it. All of them know the plans behind it. And all of them are into it. Every single one of them. The ones that told us they were Christians lied. Yes, even George W. They lied. They're all deeply involved in the occult and satanic worship. For the, for the world to be able to go to this place, you'd have to have that happen. And did I not just read to you, it says, All that do, are not truly born again are going to be worshiping the beast. Okay? Did I read that? Everybody's still with me. So world economic control... That's one thing that Revelation 13 tells us. And we just read that verse from Revelation 13, 16, and 17 about him causing them to take a mark in your right hand or your foreheads whether, so, you'll be, uh, so you'll be able to buy or sell. They already have the technology for these things. Many of you have already seen this. The RFID chip, the radio uh, frequency identification chip that's smaller than a dime implanted, be able to be scanned underneath your skin, be able to hold a lot of information on there. And again, I'm just showing you this. Some of you have seen this already. Some of you have been to some of the Perry Stone meetings and you've seen him on TV. And some of you have already seen some of this stuff. But the technology is here. And let me say this, to have worldwide control, we couldn't have had that 50 years ago, could we? To have worldwide economic control, we couldn't have had that 50 years ago. No, we had to have something called the World Wide Web. We had to have instant data transfer around the world. We had to be able to do this. And so now everything is in place for what the Bible told us would happen thousands of years ago. All right? Let's go on. What we are going to see happen in the, in the, next, in the next few years, I believe, and I think very soon, one of the things that's going to trigger all this is some major catastrophe, whether man-made or um, some, some terrible thing is going to happen. Um, recently, I was listening to um, Perry Stone and also to um, Hal Lindsey, and they brought to the atten our attention that the, in Isaiah 17 that, the, that this Damascus, Syria, is going to be completely annihilated starting in the evening, and before morning comes, it will be gone. Okay? What's interesting is in the news recently, Israel... Israel made this statement. They have now said that they consider Hezbollah, they consider Hezbollah, the, the radical terrorist group in Lebanon that's attacking Israel, they consider Hezbollah now an arm of the Syrian army because they have proven, the Israeli Mossad has proven that Syria is giving weapons and even ballistic missiles to Hezbollah. And Israel has said to Syria, if we get attacked from Hezbollah, we will obliterate Damascus. They said, we will return you, and I quote, we will return you to the Stone Age. Soon we are going to see a mushroom cloud in the Middle East. You just mark it down, it's going to happen. Isaiah 17 says, and, and it's interesting, Isaiah 17 says that the rule of the royal rule of Damascus will end. It's interesting that Israel told the king of Syria that if you attack us, or if Hezbollah attacks us, your dynasty will end, which is exactly what Isaiah 17 says. Okay? So I wanted you to see, now, I said here that destruction of Damascus is talked about in Isaiah 17, but I also believe because of Iran after nuclear weapons, I believe that Israel will probably have to attack Iran also. 
There's going to be a war over there. But I want to say this. There's also going to be something happen in the United States. And I'm just going to, I'm just speaking to you prophetically. I'm telling you, I know this is going to, something's going to happen. I don't know if it's going to be a nuclear bomb going off in one of our cities or it's going to be some kind of release of something. Something's going to happen to trigger a national emergency. And let me just say this. When a national emergency is triggered in our country, whether it be natural or man-made, I don't care if it's a Republican president or a Democrat, martial law will be instituted and your rights will be gone and you mark it down because it will happen. I've been studying this in detail and, and researching to document all these things. You need to know it will happen in the days ahead. Now, how long do we have? I don't know how long. I do know that there's plans, this in-game plan, Operation In-Game, that the United States government has. They want all these things in place. Guess when by? 2012. All right? Let's keep going. Y'all with me? The next thing that we find out from Revelation 13 and the book of Daniel is that the beast, it says, who is able to make war with him, that he will have military control. Now, it is interesting that there will have to be a unification of nations and a submission by those nations' leaders to control the militaries of the world. I mean, you think about that, what it would take to do that. Okay? But we will have military control and systematic elimination of those who will not submit to the new global agenda. Now, I just read to you from Revelation chapter 13 that it says anyone who will not take the mark of the beast, who will not follow this thing, will be killed. Do you understand? That's their plan. And I don't have time to develop every single... I could take, I could take on each one of these things an hour and prove it to you. I'm just trying this morning. I'm giving you an overview of all these things, okay? Because I want you to know what's coming. All right? But anyway, they'll have systematic elimination. So they've, they've, they've been planning this. Now, let me say this. Hitler didn't just pop up one day and all of a sudden start eliminating the Jews, did he? No, he planned it for a long time. He had to, he had to change a lot of people's hearts. He had to prepare and build his camps. He had to prepare and build ways to transport people, masses of people, to the concentration camps. He prepared it in secret for a long time. Now, what happened, he kept it secret as long as he could. Then stuff started leaking out about these camps and about people starting to disappear. Not masses of people, but just a few here and there. And guess what? People were told. They were warned. They didn't listen. They thought, no, that's not happening. That's just a conspiracy theory. Yeah, one thing you can always be sure about a conspiracy theory. It might all, not all be true, but generally some of it's true. Here's the difference between the conspiracy nuts and preachers of the gospel that's gonna, that's war, that will end up warning you. Is the difference is that if we find a conspiracy out there, and yet we can find it foretold in the Bible, guess what? It's not a conspiracy anymore. Right? It's interesting. Remember something as we get into this. What color are the UN armored vehicles down there? Why? Just remember that. All right? Let's keep going. Matthew 24 and verse 9. This is where Jesus talked about when they asked him, what will be the signs of your coming of the end of the world? Now, we just read over this, but Jesus included this in what he called the beginning of sorrows. And what he said here was, Then they shall deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Do you see that? See, we in America have had a mentality that we are, you know, above the rest of the world. Now, granted, there's always been persecution. There's been the killing of the prophets as far back as we can remember for thousands of years. Also, we know that there was a mass killing, you know, of Christians under Nero, and there was persecutions. There's been persecutions down through the centuries. But this is specifically not, it's not referring to that. Because this is referring to the question that the disciples ask, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus said, 
they will deliver you up to be afflicted and they will kill you. Meaning, in the end, there will be another great persecution coming to the church. And I'm here to tell you this morning that Americans will not escape this. We've lied to ourselves that we are somehow special and different and unique and that we're going to escape these things. And I'm telling you, America will not, and I've got proof of it. All right? Revelation 6, by the time he gets the first four seals of, are the, the well-known four horsemen of the apocalypse that they would start riding across the earth. The, the spirit of Antichrist being the white horse, the war being the red horse, the economic disturbance and famine, and then the then death. And then the, he says the fifth seal, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and the testimony which they held. Now, this is very important. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to explain this little part why. Because I read this last night and it really jumped off the page. Let me, let me just say this. You, you won't be killed for saying Jesus was a prophet. You won't be killed by, for saying Jesus was a good man, he was a good teacher. No, you will be killed, you will be questioned as to what you believe about Jesus Christ being God and the Word of God being true. Notice it says that they were slain for the Word of God. They would not back off that Jesus Christ is God, that He is the only way to heaven. There is no other Messiah. There is no other way. He's not a God. He's not some cosmic Christ that Buddha was also and all these things. No. Do you know that even Muslims, even Muslims believe that Jesus was a great prophet? They actually teach in the Quran that... Jesus will come back in the end and declare that he's not God, but that he will be, and that he will say that Islam is the religion and that he will do away with the beast and the false prophet. It's interesting how they mix this together. Okay? But any religion or anybody that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, meaning Christ, meaning the eternal one, the creator of heaven and earth, that's the question that's going to be. Notice that the worship of the image of the beast, the statue, right? Christians and anybody that obeys the word of God knows that you make no statue. The second commandments make no image of anything on the earth, under the earth to bow down to it. But we have had for a long time now billions of people being conditioned by the Roman Catholic Church and other religions that it's okay to, to, to bow to a statue and, and also to say you follow Jesus. Okay, I don't have time to develop, but I want you to see that they would not let go of their testimony of the word of God. And they were slain for the testimony which they held. Okay. For this all to take place. That's a scary picture, isn't it? For all this to take place. To get to the end. Where there would be a global world government that they would all get to the point they worship the dragon. Okay? There would have to be, over the years, a rise of the occult among political leaders. Does that stand to reason? Meaning, they're into the occult, they're into occult practices, they're into worship of demons and even Satan himself. For them to be going along with the plan of the Antichrist, the spirit of Antichrist, and the powers of the satanic community in this world, the leaders would have to be in with them, right? Right? Y'all are looking at me funny. Now, you know what I'm doing this morning, right? I'm not asking you any question. I don't already know the answer for. But I want you to think it makes sense, Right? Do you think that just overnight they could come up with a systematic way to eliminate millions of people? They would have to be in on it together, wouldn't they? They'd have to be making plans. Well, let's see if they are. Jeremiah 11, 9 through 10. I want to read this to you. This is a, We're going to read a couple of scriptures, but I wanted you to see the terminology here. Jeremiah 11, 9 and 10 here says, And the Lord said unto me, 
A conspiracy is found among the men of Judah and among the inhabitants of Jerusalem. They are turned back to the iniquities of their forefathers, which refused to hear my words, and they went after other gods to serve them. The house of Israel and the house of Judah have broken my covenant, which I have made with their fathers. I want, to, I, want you to, I want to say this with me. We can say this about America very clearly here. You can say, and the Lord said unto me, there is a conspiracy found among the men of America and among the inhabitants of Washington, D.C. They are turned back to the iniquities of their forefathers, which refused to hear my words. They went after other gods to serve them. And the house of the United States of America have broken my covenant, which I made with their fathers. There were some godly people that started this country. Some godly people that stood for what was right, that caused this country to become what it became. Let's, let's read on. Just remember, they have turned to other gods. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, behold, I will bring evil upon them. And they shall not be able to escape. And I want to say that speci speaks specifically to the great tribulation that's coming. The wrath of God will be poured out on these evil men. But they will appear to prosper for a time. But I want you to read it. It says, Behold, I will bring evil upon them. They shall not be able to escape. And though they shall cry unto me, I will not hearken unto them. Then shall the cities of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem go and cry unto the gods whom they offer incense. But they shall not save them at all in, in the time of their trouble. For according to the number of thy cities were thy gods, O Judah. Now notice it doesn't just say one God. I want you to remember these things. We're going to be very specific this morning. It didn't just say one God. He said the, the, the number of your cities were gods. He said, O Judah, according to the number of the streets of Jerusalem, have you set up altars to that shameful thing, even altars to burn incense unto Baal. But just remember that there were many gods of the, the heathens back then. There was Baal, there was Molech, there was Chemosh, there was Ashtoreth. There was a demon from, from a demon spirit from Babylon named uh, Lilith. How many, how many of you ever heard of Lilith? Anyway, it says that shameful thing, even altars to burn incense to Baal. Many of, them, many of them would interchange names as well. They'd call Molech Baal and Baal Molech. I mean, they just, they just mixed it all together. Okay, let's let's go on. Are you with me still? Second Chronicles twenty four seventeen through twenty one. You can turn to it. You can write it down and look at it later. It says now after the je death of Jehoiada came the princes of Judah and made obeisance to the king. And then the king hearkened unto them, and they left the house of the Lord God of their fathers and served groves and idols. Do you see that? It says they served what groves. And idols, okay? Now, groves could be in anywhere. It usually was in the woods with trees around or a place that they could be secluded. But usually a grove referred to the worship of the goddess Ashtoreth, which had to do with lust and fertility and all kinds of things, okay? You know, you could say Ashtoreth and Lilith and all these things are, are pretty much one Isis from Egypt. But anyway, it says that they worshipped and served groves and idols. And wrath came upon Judah and Jerusalem for this trespass. Yet he sent prophets to them to bring them again to the Lord. And they testified against them, but they would not give ear. And the Spirit of God came upon Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, the priest, which stood above the people and said unto them, Thus saith God, Why transgress ye the commandments of the Lord that you cannot prosper? And because you have forsaken the Lord, he has also forsaken you, and they conspired against him and stoned him with stones at the commandment of the king in the court of the house of the Lord. And this is the prophet Zechariah that Jesus mentioned about. You have stoned the prophets, and he said from Zechariah until now. He mentioned this. So I wanted you to see, though, that the kings, the kings did this, right? Let's keep going. There was a place in California called the Bohemian Grove. Has anybody heard of the Bohemian Grove? It's funny. In all my study for 23 years of studying and dealing with people coming out of the occult, dealing with all kinds of stuff, I cannot believe I never heard of this place. Okay? 
And this past week, I stumbled upon this completely by accident. <laughs> and once I stumbled upon this, I began to dig a little bit. What is the Bohemian Grove? You see that picture right there is a real altar with the stone statue of an owl. And as we'll show you in a second, I want you to understand the imagery of the owl. The imagery of the owl is what Lilith was represented. Lilith was known, the demon Lilith from Babylon was known as a screech owl. She was part female with feet of an owl and the wings of an owl, but also one of the earliest, and you're going to see it in a second, one of the earliest sculptures of her were with two owls sitting on her side. This idol is in a grove among the big redwood trees in California near Sacramento. You can Google all this. You can find it all yourself. Okay? But this is out there in the woods. It's called, also called the Bohemian Club. It's a private club that has very powerful and elite members of society. And they have a list of members only about 2,000. They have a list of honorary members. They have a list of regular guests. Um, anyway, I think some of you know where this is going. This is an older picture of the idol. They, they actually, the, the club members and the people who frequent this, actually call this uh, idol uh, Molet. Okay? This is stuff, and I want to say this, this stuff is taken from their own documents. I have found New York Times articles, San Francisco Chronicle articles. I, I, I've done my homework, and I want you to know, you can do it too, but I'm not telling you anything that came from some conspiracy nuts website. I went and found out myself, Wikipedia, books. And what's interesting, the, the way God took me all the way back around to this is a book I had 20 years ago. And I remember reading the story about the Franklin cover-up. You'll see that in a second, about the Franklin cover-up. And God, God, what he did for me this week is he put together all the pieces of the puzzle that I've known for many years. All right? As you see, there are people around there. Um, the Bohemian Grove is a 2,700-acre compound located at 20601 Bohemian Avenue in Monteria, California belonging to a private San Francisco-based men's art club known as the Bohemian Club. In mid-July each year, the Bohemian Grove hosts a three-week encampment of some of the most powerful men in the world. This is uh, a rare find. A person came across this. This is the Annals of the Bohemian Grove, Volume, it says there, 7, from 1987 to 1996. And there were only about, uh, it said about 200 of these made, and one got out. Somebody got a hold of one. Okay? And these are just scanned pictures, but it shows us some things. It says the 125th anniversary of the founding of the Bohemian Grove. And let's just look at some of the pages on the inside. Now, I'm going to explain something here, but the highlight of the three-week encampment is what they call a ritual that they do. And the ritual is called the cremation of care. That's what they call it. Basically, what it is that they put forth to the public is a mock human sacrifice to Molech. And what they do is they supposedly go through this ritual, and it can be seen on the Internet. Somebody snuck in and filmed this thing. And they don't deny that they do a mock human sacrifice. But they do this human sacrifice, and of course, to the god Molech, you had to burn the sacrifice in the fire. And the god Molech was the, Molech was the one that, that the children of Israel and the Canaanites and the ones who worshipped Molech would sacrifice their children in the fire to Molech. It was one of the greatest abominations to God that existed in the Old Testament. And Solomon ended up doing this. Okay? That's why I personally do not believe Solomon's in heaven. All right? Now, I'm, I didn't take time to look up who these members are, but let's see who some of their other members are. 
Now, this is very interesting. This is around the lake. There's a lake in front of the idol, and there's places where, where a couple of thousand people can gather. But this is from their book, Lakeside. They have these lakeside chats, okay? And they have these lakeside chats, and this was in 1991. Helmut Schmidt, who is the chancellor of Germany, and at the time he was the only, he's the only German to be chancellor of just West Germany and now of all of Germany, okay? Now, he was doing a lakeside chat to the most powerful men in the world, okay? I'm talking about world leaders, bankers. It's interesting the group they have, world leaders, world bankers, military contractors. Alan Greenspan, for instance, has been a member of this club since 1984, okay? Here's what he says. It says here, and I'll read this for those of you sitting toward the back. He says, uh, this is from page 243 of their own book. German Chancellor Helmut Schmidt addresses the elite of the world at a lakeside talk. Helmut Schmidt, in his own autobiography, which you can look up yourself, Men and Powers, a Political Retrospective, says that he is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, the Trilateral Commission, and the Bilderberg Group, all groups that are advocating a one-world government. He also says that he has been an active participant in bringing in world government. This is in 1991. Okay? Mr. Smith also said in his book that leaders from globalist bodies travel to the Grove every summer. He talks about secret groves in Germany where they do druidic rituals. Druid rituals. Can I just say this? The druids are hardcore Satanists into human sacrifice. Okay? Where they do druidic rituals, but indicates that the Bohemian Grove is his favorite place to participate in these rituals. Do you see that? World government. There he is. Now, let's see some other people who speak there. Other notable members. This is a lakeside talk that George W. Bush and his dad, Bush Sr., is doing there. Newt Gingrich. I didn't check out who the guy was there in the bottom. Just remember that, though. Bush 1 and Bush 2, okay? And old Newt. Here's also some other regular visitors. Some of these are members and some of them, I guess you'll remember, this is Jack uh, Kemp here who ran for president one year, of course, our one-time uh, president there back in the 70s, Jimmy Carter. Jim Stockdale was an admiral in the Navy, one of the most decorated Vietnam War veterans, but completely into uh, occultism from, you can just look him up, and Jerry Cole, I couldn't figure out who he was, but just some other notable members. Let's keep going. Um, the membership of this club that worships Molech, do you understand what I'm saying here? This private club, the membership list, has included every Republican U.S. president since 1923, as well as some Democrats, many cabinet officials, directors, and CEOs of large corporations, including major financial institutions, major military contractors, oil companies, banks, including the Federal Reserve, utilities, including nuclear power, and national media, broadcast and print, have, hi have high-ranking officials as club members or guests. Here is a picture from 1967 at the Bohemian Grove. Ronald Reagan was a member. And Richard Nixon was a member since 1954. And here is a talk. Now, this was in 1967 when, uh, when Nixon was vice president of the United States and Reagan was still governor of California. This man speaking here, Harvey Hancock, was uh, Nixon's um, campaign manager and supporter. Um, as you can see, who's leading the conversation? Well, there's a lot of men behind the scenes, but I wanted you to see this. Reagan, Reagan, was a, Reagan wasn't just a guest. He was a member. Okay? Let's keep going. Um, here's some of the, the stuff about the owl symbolism. If you just Google, I mean, you, you Google this, look it up in Wikipedia, I just wanted you to see some of the things that nearly every uh, demonic culture, from the Aztecs to the Mayans uh, to Indian tribes, to people going, I mean, going all the way back to Babylon. This is not something that's hidden. The owl symbolism represents death and the dark powers of the occult. Okay? Anybody can look this up. 
George W. could have looked this up. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, in fact, he's one of them, the Aztec god of death. You can, you can look all this up yourself. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. Um, this is, I mentioned ago, a minute ago, you can look this up about Lilith, the legendary creature that appears in many creation myths. She has many origins, but she can be traced back to Babylon. She is the demon, now remember this, of unabated lust. She's also known as a succubus or the demon that visits men in the night. Okay? She's a demon of lust, and she was represented throughout. And she is also one who seduces men and known as the one who eats children, and she has appeared as a screech owl. In nearly every religion, even Islam considers Lilith a, the representation of a witch who steals children. Okay? In every culture recognizes this. All right? Let's keep going. Here's a picture of Lilith. This is an ancient discovery. Um, my wife uh, did the censorship for me there. Um, <laughs> but in uh, here it is. I, I, and I wrote down here, basically, if you want a definition of Lilith, Lilith is a Babylonian demon of lust and seduction referred to as a screech owl or great owl and recognized as a witch that steals and kills children. And actually, some theologians and Bible scholars believe that she is referred to in Isaiah chapter 34 as the great owl. Okay? Um, up here, I said this is a, in Western mystery tradition, Lilith, and, and I want you to remember all this, Lilith with the Kila, uh, Klipoth, or whatever that is, of the Kabbalah, uh, the Kabbalah this Weor guy says in his book, the Pistis, which is the Greek word for faith, the faith of Sophia, unveiled, writes that homosexuals are the henchmen of Lilith, and likewise women who undergo willful abortion and those who support this practice are seen in the sphere of Lilith. Okay? Now this is all important. Remember, homosexuals are her lynchmen. Okay? Are y'all with me? Is this too boring this morning? Too much information? Let's keep going. But, but I wanted you to notice she is a morph between an owl and a human. But notice from ancient Babylon, the owl's with her. Okay? What was that big statue in Bohemian Grove? It was an owl, right? All right, let's keep going. Nixon, old Nixon. You know, they didn't want Nixon in, as president for, for a number of reasons we've discovered. But Nixon, <laughs> I, had to, I had to do this, y'all. These are on the Watergate tapes. You can hear them. They're well documented. Here's what he talks about that goes on at the Bohemian Grove, okay? Apart from the ritual of the worship of Molech. This is from the Watergate tapes. You can, I've heard them myself. He says, the Bohemian Grove that I attend from time to time, he said, the Easterners and the others come there, but it is the most faggy, GD thing you could ever imagine. That San Francisco crowd that goes in there, it's just terrible. I mean, I won't shake hands with anybody from San Francisco. This was in 1973. Because the rumors had crept out, and now there is proof that basically what goes on in the Bohemian Grove after they do their ritual to the demon god Molech is that they have male prostitutes shipped in there, and it's basically one big homosexual orgy on a regular basis. And that there is no way you're a member of this group and that you don't know this is going on. He was not a homosexual. Matter of fact, if you, we read further in some of the, the documentation of the Watergate tapes where he, is, he, he said homosexual. He understood it, but he said you shouldn't, it shouldn't be promoted on television. It, should, it was the downfall of society. I mean, Nixon, I think because he was not in with the homosexual agenda is one of the reasons that they ousted him. Okay? But anyway, that's enough. But look what he said about the, the impact or the power of the, these members of the Bohemian Grove. He said, if I were to choose the speech that gave me the most pleasure and satisfaction in my political career, it would have been my lakeside speech at the Bohemian Grove in July of 1967. Because this speech traditionally was off the record, 
it was it received no publicity at the time. But in many important ways, it marked the first milestone in my road to the presidency. Let me just say this. You don't become president of the United States anymore unless you're in with these guys. Here's an interesting little tidbit. This is the Washington Times. This is a confirmed story that in 1988, in late 1988, before Reagan left the White House, that there was a scandal with homosexual prostitution and snares VIPs with Reagan and Bush that call boys took a midnight tour of the White House. This was proven by credit card receipts. Back then, we didn't have the automatic, you know, they still had the little slide things, and it got, anyway, it got found out that homosexual call boys and several were underage, were at the White House at midnight with Reagan and Bush there. Now, there's a lot to this story, but let's put two and two together. Reagan and Bush are members of the Bohemian Grove. It's well known that there's homosexual activity at the Bohemian Grove. And here we have a scandal break open in 1989 of homosexual call boys at the White House. You be the judge. Let's keep going. This is the book I was talking about that I had 20 years ago. Due to the fact that one of my first converts that I led to Jesus was a witch and into a satanic coven. She told me things that I thought were amazing back then, but now I see that they're all true. But because of dealing with her and seeing the demonic power and the, the witch's coven and, and hearing of human sacrifice and hearing of officials and, and, and powerful people be involved in this stuff, you know, I just kind of all, you know, you just kind of file that kind of stuff back in your brain a little bit and go, okay, you know, I can believe that anybody can be worship the devil. And remember, one of the temptations of, of Jesus was the devil said, fall down and worship me and I'll give you all of the world, the nations of the glory of it. Jesus didn't do it, but there's been a lot of men who've done it. They have bowed their knee to Satan, and he has given them the world. What is the Franklin cover-up? Cover well, I'm going to read a little bit of this right here. It says, the Franklin cover-up started when the shutdown of Omaha, Nebraska's Franklin Community Federal Credit Union was raided by federal agencies in November 1988. It sent shockwaves all the way to Washington, D.C., $40 million was missing. The credit union's manager, Republican Party activist Lawrence E. Larry King Jr., behind whose rise to fame and riches stood the powerful figures in Nebraska politics and businessmen and in the nation's capital. In the face of the opposition from local and state law enforcement, from the FBI, from powerful the Omaha World Herald, a special Franklin committee of the Nebraska legislature launched its own probe that looked into the financial swindle, and it soon exploded into a hideous tale of drugs, Iran-Contra money laundering, and a nationwide child abuse ring and ritual murder. Nineteen months later, the legislative committee's chief investigator died suddenly and violently, like more than a dozen other people linked to the Franklin case. Author John DeCamp here was in the Nebraska State Legislature and part of that committee, and he wrote this book and exposed it all. Well, let me just explain to you real quick where this whole thing led back to. This whole thing led back to President George Herbert Walker Bush. And that's why the CIA and the FBI worked so hard to keep this from coming out. How do we know? It's a long story. Like I said, I could spend a lot of time on this. But right here, this Larry King Jr. that eventually went to prison for five years, only five years, there were several young people who told that they were sexually molested and abused by these people, and there was enough evidence in court for these, one of them to be awarded a million dollars in damages. Several people went to prison. But guess who this Larry, this Lawrence E. Larry King Jr. is? Guess, guess who he sung the national anthem for at their inauguration? 
George Herbert Walker Bush. Close friends. Guess where also this guy attended regularly? The Bohemian Grove. I'm just going to say this. There is evidence. There is evidence and there is... It's pretty clear that not only does homosexual activity go on at the Grove, but pedophilia. And that some of the rituals are not mock human sacrifices. Okay? I don't have time to develop it, but I'm convinced. Here we go. Let's go to the next phase of this. Are there, are there U.S. concentration camps? Now, for, for some time, rumors have been spread around, but I want to say this. The first word that I heard about this, now please understand, I want everybody to look at me, look at me. The first, this, is, this is going to seem outlandish for now, okay? But there's enough proof, and I'm going to show you. But the first time I heard that there were FEMA camps being built and FEMA detention centers was not from the Internet, it was not from anybody else. It was from Nancy, who has a friend that she spoke to directly, who is high up in the Department of Immigration. Okay? So this came directly, and it made me start looking. It made me start digging. And once I started digging, I started finding out some things. Okay? These are pictures in the, across the U.S., and one of them's in Nashville, by the way. This one. There are pictures of these camps being built all over the United States. I mean, I, I could have put up hundreds of pictures. There are new facilities. The barbed wire leans in, not out. It's out to keep people out. It's in to keep people in. You understand? But are they being built? Let's see if there's any evidence of this. Okay? We just asked the question. It takes us all the way back to the 1980s. What is Rex 84 in FEMA? This is something that first got exposed with Oliver North in the Iran-Contra hearings. He was asked about it and then started whispering to his lawyer, and the congressman who was asking him about this plan was told by another senator, a senator, that that was classified and to not address that any further. But now this stuff has come out. Rex 84, in short, was a readiness, readiness exercise 1984, a plan by the United States federal government to test their ability to detain large numbers of American citizens in the case of civil unrest or national emergency. The Miami Herald reported on this on July 5, 1987. Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North and the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, had drafted a contingency plan providing for the suspension of the Constitution, the imposition of martial law, and the appointment of military commanders to head state and local governments and to detain dissidents and Central American refugees in the event of a national crisis. This is all out there for you to find. Okay? Let's go on. This is more about Rex 84, and I want you to look at some of the things. Rex 84 Alpha explained that this was a readiness exercise, otherwise known as the continuity of government plan, indicates that FEMA, in association with 34 other federal civil departments and agencies, along with other NATO nations, conducted a civil readiness exercise during April 5th through the 13th, 1984. It was conducted in coordination and simultaneously with the Joint Chiefs exercise night train. Now remember that. Night train. If you're going to detain large numbers of American people, you've got to have some way to move them around. Just remember that. Night Train, a worldwide military command post exercise, including Continental U.S. Forces, or CONUS, based on, uh, on multi-emergency scenarios operating both abroad and at home. And I'm not going to read all this. DOD, Secret Service, CIA, everybody's involved, all the alphabet soup. The exercise anticipated... Civil disturbances, major demonstrations, and strikes that would affect continuity of government and resource mobilization. And this was to fight subversive activities 
there was author authorization for the military to implement government ordered movements of civilian populations. Stop right there. Movements of civilian populations. How and where? I like my home. Where are you moving me to and how are you doing it? Get my, get, get my drift here. 1984, government ordered this and of civil populations at state and regional levels to arrest the arrest of certain unidentified segments of the population. Do you see that? Arresting segments of the population. Now, one of the things that bled out about this, and this was one thing that was so terrible, one of the things that came out was that they were fearful that there was going to be an African-American unrest, and they prepared to arrest and detain and move into these camps 21 million African-Americans, if need be. This was way back then. Now, it isn't about black or white. It's about Christian. All right, let's keep going. Well, if you're going to have camps, you've got to have funding for camps. Government funding, right? And you've got to have somebody to build them. This is taken, you can look it up, this is from the Wall Street Journal, Market Watch, their page, you can Google this, Halliburton, the building of detention centers, San Francisco, KBR, a subsidiary of Halliburton, which, guess who was in charge of Halliburton? Anybody know? Dick Cheney. Um, anyway, Halliburton, oh, by the way, Dick Cheney's a member of Bohemian Grove, too. All right. Um, Anyway, it was awarded a contingency contract from the Department of Homeland Security to support its immigration and customs enforcement facilities in the event of an emergency. The maximum total value of the contract is $385 million and consists of a one-year base period with four one-year options. Um, anyway, it's held previous. The ICE here is the um, immigration control people. Anyway, the contract was to run from 2000 to 2005. The contract, which is effective immediately, provides, do you see this, provides for the establishing of temporary detention and processing capabilities and the emergency, they're saying the, in case of the emergency influx of immigrants into the U.S., <laughs> that's been going on for a long time. They hadn't stopped it yet and they hadn't done anything about it. Right. So anyway, the contract provides migrant detention support to other government organizations in the event of an immigration emergency, as well as the development of a plan to react to a national emergency such as natural disaster, the company said. So Homeland Security is paying Halliburton $385 million over four years. This article, this happened in January 24, 2006, to build detention centers. So they're getting built. Right? Those pictures weren't made up. Right? All right? I want to show you something here. This is taken from the United States Army website. You can Google this and it'll take you straight to it. It had to be declassified due to the uh, Information of Freedom Act. This document is Army Regulation 210-35, effective 14 February 2005 on installations and civilian inmate labor program. And basically down here I underlined it, it says the establishing of installations and civilian inmate labor programs. Just so you see it. You can look this up yourself. Here's a nice little thing and I said we'd get to this. This is a plan called Endgame. Operation Endgame. Office of Detention and Removal Strategic Plan, 2003 to 2012, Detention and Removal Strategy for a Secure Homeland, Department of Homeland Security. I don't have time to get into all this, but I just want you to see. All of them are working together. H.R. 645. H.R. 645, 111th Congress, first session, January 22, 2009. This is to direct the Secretary of Homeland Security to establish national emergency centers on military installations. That means in case of a national emergency 
or in case there's a biological, what they're saying, in case there's a biological attack or something of that nature, we've got to turn. Remember, they closed down a lot of military bases, right? Well, what they've done now is started funding to have these things refurbished. All right? Don't have time, but this one you can, you can look up yourself. H.R. 645. There's been some people out doing some investigating, and I just put on here, I don't know. Now, I'm going to tell you here, I don't know if these are, but it's interesting. Are these boxcars for Night Train 84? These different kind of boxcars have been appearing now. People have been taking pictures of them all over the country and in different places, and some of them near these detention centers. Um, this is in New Jersey. Another one was in Montana. Another one was somewhere else. I can't remember. I mean, I could have put up, I could have put up hundreds of pictures of these things. The interesting thing is, if you notice, they're different. Here's you a regular one, right? Regular box car. Here's one that's much taller, and these are air vents. Now, the only vented box cars I've ever seen is to carry animals. They look a lot different than those, right? That's all I'm going to say about that. Do like Forrest Gump. That's all I'm going to say about that. Revelation 20 and verse 4. He said, I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads, are in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Is that in your Bible? We have Jesus saying it in Matthew 24, they're going to deliver you up to be afflicted and kill you at the beginning of the sorrows. We have the fifth seal being open, and we see people there had been slain for their testimony. We see here in Revelation 20 is at the judgment those who were, and it's interesting, it, lets, it gives us not just that people were killed, but how they were killed. I've often wondered about this because, you know, Hitler lined up a bunch of people and shot them until they fell over into a mass grave. And then he burned a lot of them in gas ovens. Why beheading? Why beheading? Why would beheading come back, you know? French Revolution, all those things. Why would that be, in the end, a mode of people being killed? Now, there, now Islam beheads people. They behead people that insult Islam. Okay? But I think it goes further than that. And all I'm going to say about this, <laughs> I'm about to give you the freakiest part of this information. Okay? There's not a lot of evidence of this, but there is some. If you're going to behead people, you might need something to do it with. And I was trained in martial arts a little while and learned how to use a samurai sword for a while, but that's not very effective. You have to be very skilled and know what you're doing. You don't just swing it. You actually swing with a slice, and it has to be very precise. Right? I know this is very graphic. But how did they do it during the French Revolution? Guillotine. All right? I don't know. How, what, what did you say? Guillotine. All right, whatever. There are rumors floating around. And I'm gonna, all I'm going to say is rumors right now. That people have seen shipments of guillotines and being shipped and hidden on these military installations. But if so, this has probably been the best, most secretive thing that they've done so far. But there is a little hint. A little hint. And it's this. There was a bill presented to the, of all places, the State House in Georgia. This is HB 1274. I wanted you to see that I took this from, where does that say? Legislature, State of Georgia website. <laughs> okay? 
Do you see that? We're going to go to the next one, make it a little bigger so you can see this, because I wanted you to see this. HB 1274, death penalty, guillotine provisions. What this says here is the HB 74, death penalty, guillotine provisions. Let's go to the next thing. Here's what we'll read. Bill to be enacted, or to, uh, to be entitled an act to amend the Article 2 of Chapter 10 of Title 17 of the Official Code of Georgia, annotated, relating to the death penalty generally, so as to provide a statement of legislative policy to provide death by guilty. It says to provide for and uh, repeal, and notice what it says, to repeal conflicting laws. And then, um, let's read this down here. If you can't see it, I'm going to read it. This is why they're going to do this. The General Assembly finds that while prisoners condemned to death may wish to donate one or more of their organs for transplant, any such desire is thwarted by the fact that electrocution makes all such organs unsuitable for transplant. The intent of the General Assembly in enacting this legislation is to provide for a method of execution which is compatible with the donation of organs by a condemned prisoner. Good old Georgia. Right? Good old Georgia. So here is what I'm going to say. You can sit here and go, well, you're talking crazy, man. Here I see a state in the United States talking about making a provision to use a guillotine. And I see in the Bible them talking about beheadings being a mode of killing people in the end. Now let me just say this. Here's the real deal. Let's just get it. Let's just get real. Are you really ready to stand for Jesus no matter what? No matter what? See, here, here, here's what, how do I say this? In seeing this, what I see in a nutshell is the United States is a lot further along than we, than we had thought, really. The mass persecution of Christians is coming to the whole world. Not over there. Here. I can't even get into, there are, there are a myriad of executive orders that have taken away everything. At the moment of a national crisis or emergency, the president can take over. And, and everybody, let, let me tell you something. We've been deceived. Because the liberals, the liberal Democrats were freaking out because they were seeing Bush do this stuff. The Republicans, the conservatives are freaking out because they're seeing Obama do stuff. And what y'all got to get in your minds is they're all against us. None of them, none of them are Christian. And it doesn't matter if it's a Republican or a Democrat, when it comes time for the one world government, the one world money control, when it comes time to take over, and what they want to do is depopulate the earth, we're first on the list. Now, does that mean I say don't vote? No, go out and vote. Every now and then, we might get a true person at some low local level. And I think we might have a few good congressmen and a few good senators. But any body of power worships Satan. They don't, if they wanted to, let me tell you who else has been seen at the Grove worshiping Molech. Clarence Thomas, a Supreme Court justice. If Listen, at one point, we had a Republican president, Senate, House, and Supreme Court, and nothing was done to stop abortion. You want to know why it didn't get stopped? They don't really want it stopped. These people who worship these demons, our leaders, want the child sacrifices to continue. 
They know that the blood on the land continues to defile the land and give the demonic powers more and more power and authority over us. Abortion could have been stopped a long time ago in America. They never wanted it to be. It's made money for them. And I'm going to tell you what else. What they're going to do when they start this, why, why do they want to cut your head off? So they can sell your organs. It's what it's about. Listen, Hitler, before he committed suicide, and Hitler was deeply involved in the occult. The swastika comes from ancient Hinduism. And they can trace it all the way back to Kush, the swastika. And what is, what is traditionally those paganite countries and nations persecuted Israel, right? He picked that symbol very carefully, right? He was deeply involved in the occult. Right before he committed suicide, he said, I'll be back. My spirit will return. I will return. Doesn't all this stuff sound familiar? And I, won't, I hadn't even told you the real scary stuff. So here's the thing. One of two things is going to happen. And I, I'm just going to say this. You can dismiss me as a crazy nut. But you've been warned. And I will say this. I'm going to do everything in my power. You know what this has encouraged me to do? First of all, to live holy. It grieves me for the times that I know that I have not done things God wanted me to do. And what this has done for me, it has made me want to tell everybody I can. It's time to get right with God. It's time to get close to God. It's time to understand that, you know what? Jesus has got to be first. And, and I'm going to end on a good note. I want to say this. Zechariah, Zephaniah, I've been reading Zephaniah. And Zephaniah said this. When it came time when God was going to judge the world, said make a speedy riddance of all these wicked people on the earth. He said pray. He said seek the Lord, seek humility, seek righteousness that you may be hid in that day. When God got ready to destroy Egypt and he started sending the plagues on Egypt, what happened when the first plague started? Did Pharaoh let him go? What did he do? He increased his what? Persecution, didn't he? But what happened when God began raining everything down on him? He protected him, right? See, this is what we miss. I, I hear some of these prophecy teachers talk about this pre-trib rapture thing, and they use they use Egypt. Well, God took the children of Israel. You, yeah, He didn't take them. He didn't take them out before He rained anything down or before anything bad happened. We forget they were in Egypt four hundred years. Great persecution rose against them before even the plagues were poured out. And this is what I'm saying. We'll deal with the rapture on another occasion. I believe in a rapture is going to happen. When it's going to happen? I don't know. I can say what I think. Prophecy teachers on TV, they can say what they think. I'm telling you, be ready. Be ready to go. Be ready to face whatever may come. But whatever you do, be close to Jesus. And start telling people. Start telling people. You can, you can prove. There's so many prophecies that you can take and prove to people the Word of God is the Word of God. My heart grieves, let me tell you something, my heart grieves for is Christians who think they're going to go, that they're ready to go, and they're living in sin and they're not ready to go. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray in the name of Jesus this morning that you will, that you will speak to our hearts, God. You wrote all these things and you had your prophets and your apostles write these things so that we would not be caught unaware. You had them write these things so we would know how we ought to live. So that we would know, God, that judgment and wrath is coming. That our enemies are out there. 
you never promised us that we would not be you have to go through anything or have persecution. But Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that you will stir our hearts to return to you with our whole heart. That we will, God, put aside every and every weight that holds us back and every idol and everything that gets in the way between, between us and you. And I pray, God, that you will help us as we live the Christian life and walk close to you, that you will help us be a light and a witness to those around us. Because, Lord, they may not listen right now, but these seeds may save their lives, their eternal souls later on. So, Lord, I pray for your anointing on each and every one, and I pray, God, that you do it in Jesus' name. Now, I want to say this. I don't know how long I took, and I'm sorry, but I felt like this was vitally, vitally important. Look it up. Everything that I put out there this morning, you can find yourself. Check me out and go see. Amen? All right. Let's eat.